Hello, good morning or good afternoon to everybody joining us today. Welcome to today's webinar about unlocking European opportunities in the artificial intelligence and machine learning landscape. Now, we're really excited to have all of you here. We've seen there's been quite some participants joining from many different countries. Uh, we had registrants from Jordan, from Egypt, from Uganda, as well as Egypt, um, and quite some from Bangladesh and India as well. So welcome to all of you. Now, we know this is a topic that's been generating quite some interest. Um, we're sure you're all very curious about the kind of opportunities that come with these new technologies. And we hope that today's webinar is able to give you some inspiration and some ideas and tips about how to tap into these opportunities and, and unlock any chances to further um, communicate with the European market. Let's start it off. So I'd like to start with a quick introduction. So hello, everybody. My name is Simone Snuyenbos. I'm a program manager at CBI, the organization hosting today's webinar, which I will tell you a little bit about in a bit. Um, but as we wait for some more participants to join, I'd just quickly like to go through a few house rules and give you a bit of an introduction to the platform that we're using today. Some of you may already be familiar with the GoToWebinar, uh, but for those of you that aren't, um, it's important for you to know, first of all, that we cannot see or hear you. So if everything is going right, you should be able to see and hear us, um, but we will not be interacting with you. We won't be able to see you. So if you have any questions, and please, if you do have any, uh, feel free to ask. Um, please make use of the chat option, which you should be able to see in the control panel of the um, GoToWebinar platform. Feel free to ask questions at any point. If a speaker is telling you about something you'd like to hear more about, just let us know in the chat box and we'll have dedicated moments during the webinar where we'll try to address the questions that are most frequently asked. If you're having problems with the audio, um, one option is to try the phone call option. Uh, so this will dial you in through a phone line. Um, it'll be toll free and a local tariff, so it shouldn't generate any more cost. And in some cases does lead to, to a better sound connection. Um, finally, throughout the webinar, we will have uh, some polls. Please participate. We're very curious to hear from you. Uh, you don't need to do anything. They'll automatically pop up on your screen and uh, you'll just be able to click on the answer that um, that most uh, fits with what, uh, what you and your company do. So moving on, and uh, before I hand it over to our panel of experts that we've gathered today for you, just a quick intro to, to CBI. So as I mentioned, this webinar is hosted by the Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. So CBI is the acronym for the Dutch name um, of the agency. We are a governmental agency of the um, part of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, and our funding comes from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. So what's our mission and why do we exist? Um, CBI basically supports SMEs to become more sustainable environmentally and socially through their exports, particularly to the European market, but of course also to regional markets, which in some cases are easier to access and more relevant for some exporters. And how do we do this? CBI offers practical solutions uh, for bottlenecks that exporters face um, in their exporting value chain. And one of these uh, bottlenecks that we all know is very common, particularly for SMEs, is the lack of access to information. Information about the market they're targeting, the requirements, current trends and opportunities. And that's where we try to add value. So CBI um, provides the kind of knowledge that SMEs can use to overcome these bottlenecks and successfully um, ensure access to the European market. Now, when I talk about information and knowledge, um, one of the key parts of this is the webinars that we host, such as today's webinar. So we hope that this indeed provides the kind of information you need. Um, and also particular market studies that we produce and that are free to access for all that I will introduce to you towards the end um, of the webinar. 
with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to Marike, one of our experts and panelists today. She will be further moderating today's webinar. Hello, everyone. Good morning or, and good afternoon. Um, yeah, I would like to tell you why you're here in case um, you were doubting if you should uh, stay here. You definitely should because I'm sure that you uh, want to learn a lot about the European market for uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning software development and where the opportunities lie where and how to uh, make the most out of these opportunities. You probably um, want to know which countries would be interesting to you to export to and you want to learn uh, real life examples. So uh, let's get this webinar started. My name is uh, Marike de Haan. I am a market researcher for Globally Cool. Globally Cool, um, our slogan is international business made easy. Um, and that is what we do. We help companies all over the world. We have worked in 70 countries to uh, make international business more easy. Um, we work a lot for CBI and for the outsourcing studies, I am the lead market researcher. And I do this uh, with Laszlo. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Laszlo. Uh, I'm an independent consultant. Uh, I have been working uh, about 25 years in uh, IT outsourcing. I worked in uh, many countries, mostly with small and medium sized uh, IT service providers that want to enter the European market. And since 2000, I have been working together with the uh, CBI. And then there's Hans Henrik joining us today. Yeah, uh, my name is Hans Henrik. I'm a uh, team uh, from Denmark. Um, I've been working with the uh, nearshore, offshore models uh, for uh, quite a number of years, both in Pakistan and in uh, Ukraine before. And uh, for the last uh, almost 15 years, I've been working uh, with Egypt, um, where we uh, have uh, our offshore development center. And our markets are primarily the uh, European market and the uh, GCC market. So that's my background. Thank you, Hans Henrik. Um, and then we're going to go over to the, the topics that we will be discussing today. There's going to be four of them. Um, can you go to the next slide, Laszlo? Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to talk about market demands opportunities and threats, the importance of specialization, and what you're probably all here for is how to find the buyers. So um, let's bring on the numbers first. Um, the current state of AI and ML adoption in Europe and the growth potential of the market and generative AI, that is what the market demand section of today is all about. And the first um, thing I have for you is um, some statistics, because I'm, I'm the lead market researcher, so I am the person who has all the numbers and the statistics in the... Um, actually, today, our uh, study about the AI and ML market is uh, going uh, live on the website of CBI. So after the webinar, I absolutely encourage you all to uh, have a look at it. Um, it also has a lot of market entry requirements, rules, regulations. We found them today to be not juicy enough to be part of this webinar. So I'm going to give you some numbers first. And uh, this one is about the companies in Europe that are already using AI technologies. Um, as you can see, the larger enterprises are definitely using um, AI a lot more than the smaller companies. Um, but you will learn later on as well that large enterprises are not necessarily the best enterprises to target in Europe because it's, that's generally quite hard. Um, and also, these numbers are from 2021. Who is interested in uh, learning some more recent numbers because the market's go growing very fast? Over the last three years, um, oh, we have to go back to the previous slide. Sorry, Laszlo. Thank you. Um, because the market grew by 40% every year, this means 
this graph shows 8% of companies in Europe were using AI in 2021. That would make it this year to be almost 16%, one six. But these numbers are from before the introduction of generative AI to the public. Um, and in early spring of this year, uh, a study was done on how many companies give artificial intelligence a top priority in their business plan. So how many companies gave AI a top priority in their business plan? It's more than 16%, I can tell you. Laszlo gave us a little sneak peek. You can go to the next slide now and reveal the number. 83%. That, I mean, of course, you know, this research can be debated like any research, um, but the numbers are crazy and it feels almost insane. And uh, as a researcher in this team, uh, what it tells me the most is that statistics are currently not giving a good overview of what's happening in the markets because the developments are going so fast. Um, that's why I'm very happy that today uh, Hans Hendrik is also with us. You can switch on your uh, video, please, uh, and the mic, because um, he works in the market directly and he can give us some very practical insight on what's happening in the markets. Um, Hans Hendrik, maybe you want to step in here because 83% crazy, huh? It seems like there's so many opportunities in the markets, but um, how do you feel about the opportunities in the markets? There's no no doubt that the AI is is uh, very very high on the agenda. I recently participated in a in a large seminar for for businesses uh, within the IT in Denmark, and that was the topic together with the quantum uh, computing and so forth. That is definitely the focus area right now. Part of the the focus is also, as you also mentioned, that that uh, with the uh, chat GPT and, and so forth, it, it's a little bit more public uh, than it has been before. And in many ways, some of the technologies are, have, have been around for, for a while and uh, are already being used. Uh, so I think the, the, the main focus uh, now is, is to go from being something of interest to being uh, something that we, uh, we actually use, uh, both uh, from a supplier side uh, and from uh, customer side and, and of course lots of companies are already using some sort of uh, AI driven uh, components uh, in, in different uh, platforms and so forth. Yeah yeah so you are also seeing I mean the 83 percent sounds a bit crazy but 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 from 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 practice you can tell that 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 the market is actually growing very fast and it has a momentum right now yeah. right? Definitely I, I, but, but I also think that, that uh, maybe some, uh, some managers and uh, top, uh, pro top uh, executives have also had a, a bit of a wake up call uh, when they suddenly had uh, chat GPT on, on their phone, uh, doing all sorts of things. And uh, that, that sometimes is the icebreaker that you need in, in, a, in a technology like this, but uh, it's definitely gonna, gonna change a lot of things. Yeah, because if if that's actually quite a, a nice bridge to the to the next slide, because uh, that will give an answer to why is the market growing, and one one of those um, uh, reasons is that people feel more comfortable using AI. Because in the I think a few years ago, a lot, a lot of companies were thinking, yeah, you know that that's like too vague or that's like scary, but so many people are using generative AI like ChatGPT now and. So you are also seeing when you are talking to customers uh, and you can point to them like, well, you're using ChatGPT, right? That's, that's an AI. Do you feel like that has uh, lowered the threshold for, for some companies to start using AI ML uh, technology? Yeah, but, but, but definitely, um, as, in, as with all technologies, we have to remember that we use technologies to, for a purpose. And, and, and the purpose of uh, using AI can be fantastic, um, but it's also a new technology. And there's a big difference between uh, doing something which does not harm anybody uh, versus doing something which is uh, having a huge impact on a, on a human being or whatever. Because it is, a, of course, an automated use of uh, technology, 
and uh, I think there's uh, quite a lot of fear uh, around some of these things still. Uh, best example is, of course, uh, cars. Uh, we can drive in uh, automated cars without driving them, uh, but uh, there's a bit of a hesitancy <laughs> getting into a car, or that could be um, uh, an airplane without a, a pilot. Um, there are things which we as a human has to adapt to also, and, and that's uh, I think a quite important factor in the in the AI, and that's also some of the legislation that is going on uh, right now in Europe, and, and uh, it is I, I believe it's expected that there will be a, um, a draft of that uh, by the end of the year, uh, where you actually uh, start working on on some legislation on, on this um, that will regulate it. And, and there is, I think, I think it will be regulated quite uh, a lot um, yeah. uh, because there is this fear. Yeah, I can. Yeah, that's 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 absolutely uh, something that we are uh, as researchers will also keep an eye on because regulations now we 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 uh, we could not discuss them very uh, much in our in our research because uh, new regulations are coming and going also every day, huh? Uh, wasn't it Italy where they where they banned Chat GPT and now they can use it again? I mean it's it's going up and down for some countries as well. So but um in general, yeah, you we can say that um there's just more data available, urbanizations going very fast, technological and advancements, investment research, and of course, like we talked about, the increased awareness and advantages of the technology and uh the acceptance of it. Because, and that's where the poll is uh, incoming, I would, uh, every one of us would really like to know who has already used generative AI to uh, help write code. It would be uh, very interesting uh, for us to see if you have or, and how you liked it. <laughs> I can I can see the results coming in. I don't think you can though, so we have to. Um, we're going to wait for a little bit. I can't. Like forty four percent of the people voted. Forty five, forty seven. Almost almost halfway through. Cast your votes. We were really we we're very curious. This is really cool. We're going to share the results, obviously. Just a little, little bit longer. We're almost at 70%. Two thirds of you voted. There are still votes coming in. Not many. Simone, what do you think? We're heading towards the last chance. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, Wow, two very obvious uh, winners. In, yes, and I'm interested to work with it to work with it more. One third of you and half said no, but I want to. Um, so we could conclude that um, the interest is winning. So yes, want to do more? No, but I want to. Uh, only 2% is not interested in uh, trying it. That would maybe be only one person or two. Um, and there's like one or two that uh, did use it, but don't like it. Don't like it yet. I say to my children when they don't uh, uh, want to try uh, to eat broccoli because they don't like it, I say, you don't like it yet. Um, I'm not sure if it's working. I'll report back in five years, but um, um, yeah. So very interesting results. Thank you for voting. Um, then we can continue to the ICT skills shortage because that's another um, graph that we um, have in our research um, that says uh, even without fast growing interest in AI and ML solutions, there is an enormous skill gap in Europe. And um, these figures are, the last figures are from 2022. As you can see, um, almost everywhere uh, the ICT skills shortage has been growing and it is big already. 
So the European market is looking for people with technical skills, but let's not forget the people skills that they're also looking for because Hans Henrik and I went to an event together and someone said very bluntly, uh, a buyer of uh, software development services said this, we hire them for skills, but we fire people for character. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty bold statement. But Hans Henrik, we also talked about that statement together and you feel same, same, but different, Why right? Do you want to share something? Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I've been doing also here in Denmark before I started working with YouTube was that I was the human resource director of an IT company. And I was always saying that, uh, well, we, we should uh, hire for the attitude and, and train for the skills. Um, and I think that's that's uh, quite important because the skills are just they, they have to be there, right? It, it's not a it's not a factor. If you don't have the skills, there's no way you you're gonna uh, be part of it. Um, the important thing is the, um, the the approach, the personality, uh, the people behind it, the, the ability to see where you can use technology, how you can use it, and um, and of course also how you will adapt new technologies and adapt them uh, fast, uh, because that's uh, one of the challenges that that, uh, that you might see somewhere, that, that people are really good at whatever they're doing uh, with, with their skills and so forth, um, but, but uh, they don't maybe have the speed and interest and so forth to, to actually adapt new technologies. And then uh, just a humble advice, always uh, remember that, that that it's not the technology that we're delivering, we're delivering a solution. And that solution has to work in the, in, in the real life. Technology is just a, a tool to deliver that. And of course, that's a whole discipline in itself, but, but for the customer, they need the uh, solution. Uh, they really don't care that much about the, uh, the uh, technology and, and, and how it's done. Uh, as long as it's done correctly and 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 it works and, and solves their solution both now and in the future. So so That's personality and 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 attitude is by far the uh, the most important factor when you when you hire people. Yeah. Wow, that that's some very solid advice there um, for all the people watching today. Um, thank you for that. There are also threats to the markets because we also have to show that, that side. Uh, it's in the next slide. Um, the first, um, oh, sorry, the opportunities first before the threats. I'm sorry, of course. Where are the opportunities? Where are we going? Um, well, in our research, we have found uh, these four. Uh, natural language processing, a lot of demand for that. Advancement in deep learning development of autonomous systems and, um, well, AI, of course, generative AI, AI-powered healthcare, medical science, risk assessment, more AI-human uh, collaboration, also called cobots and low-code and no-code AI systems. And from um, interesting uh, um, conversations with friends and family, we have also uh, heard that are, there are a lot of uh, big companies uh, at the moment trying to create their own AI ML, to, ML tool, tools based on generative AI principles. Uh, for example, for some companies, uh, they forbid their uh, employees to work with uh, ChatGPT or BARD or any other generative AI tool. Um, but they do see the opportunities uh, that it offers and how much faster the work can be done if their employees could work with that. So they are working on building their own tools. I cannot give any names, but um, uh, yeah, so that's also a very big opportunity. And then we do have the threats um, because automation will make some jobs dis disappear. The advice we offer in our studies is to offer added value. Uh, it's an advice that has been in our studies for quite some years. Uh, still very valid today. Automation is, is only increasing. So uh, yeah, make sure to offer added value. And we're also seeing uh, that buyers are increasingly moving towards one provider. Um, for a long time, 
time, we've seen uh, buyers having multiple providers and they are now preferring uh, to work with one uh, provider. So we advise you to try to secure your position as the preferred one uh, to stay on board. Uh, then there's regulatory and compliance challenges that's that um, like BART is currently not available in Europe. Some countries are banning ChatGPT, making it open to public again. Um, those things are, uh, they, they vary a lot. So we try to uh, stay very up to date in our research, but that's uh, hard. Uh, but still, you will find in our research very interesting uh, links and in to find information on the most updated versions of the rules and regulations that are uh, um, present in the markets. There's an ethic thing in generative AI, for sure, that we have to be very mindful about. Um, it's often biased, um, and we, that's why we should never stop thinking for ourselves um and like in most uh businesses ai generative ai will change many jobs also in the outsourcing sector so even if you are that person who does not want to try to work with it um maybe you know it would be interesting to at least try it to see if you uh might like it like your mother said about broccoli when you were uh, younger um because it can it can have you know it it everyone that i spoke to that has tried it uh has has really i mean it, it's a love hate relationship but still they changed uh, it changed their, their job for the better mostly so um are there any uh thing you want to add to this uh, opportunities or threats uh, hans hendrik or should we move on to uh, laszlo Maybe maybe just a few a uh, few comments, uh, and also bearing in mind um, that I've, I've I've been working with countries delivering to Europe uh, and so forth. I, you also mentioned it, Marie. Ethics is really high on the agenda. Uh, that is something which uh, really has to be uh, thought through and 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 respected and, and 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 being a part of it. And and as you also mentioned there. There is a fear also, that's why larger companies are, are doing their own uh, systems and, and, and so forth. There is a fear of, um, um, of, of uh, releasing uh, sensitive information. Uh, there's been several cases already on that. And that's uh, the, 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 the double side to these things that, that in order to have AI working, you have to feed it with information. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to feed uh, the information uh, always to, to the system and so forth. Just a, a, a small note, uh, and it, it's just a few days ago, uh, I think McKinsey re released a, a study on uh, the changes of uh, jobs uh, based on AI and so forth. I haven't had the chance to read it yet, but that also underlines the um, the comment about the things the, that, that jobs are changing and some jobs are changing. And, and in my mind that when you look at, at, at delivery organizations uh, within near shore, offshore uh, delivery centers, um, that, is, uh, that is a big uh, uh, cue to saying, well, maybe we need to step up in, in the value of what, what we're doing. So some of the the jobs which is less um, let's say intelligent and where where uh, the, 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 they are the first ones to, to disappear of course so stepping up in in in, in the hierarchy of um, of jobs would definitely be a, a good ad advice also and um and and then yeah the next step is combining the AI, of course, with the quantum uh, computers, which are still not really there. But uh, but that's uh, that's just the next step uh, where we also add one thing is the, the ability to treat data, but the other one, uh, ability is to treat data with a with an extreme speed, uh, and that's actually one of the things that <laughs> probably changes the most uh, of, uh, of things in our societies. Yeah, sorry, uh, just a few comments. No, 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 thank you. It's very uh, insightful. And also, I mean, one of the problems uh, that um, what you said about you are uh, 
you have to feed it with data, but you want to be uh, mindful of the data you give away. It's, that that could be um, a solution to to uh, develop your own AI tool, right? That's also a, a possibility, but that's probably only for the bigger companies. To you know, they can only afford that. I think for now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, for us, or there's also a chance to ask it later. If anything comes up, you can always ask it in the chat and we can, uh, we'll can we either get back to you uh, during the presentation or at the question section. So don't be afraid to ask. Thank you, Marie Candide. And we do actually have um, one question that has come in. It's regarding how AI and uh, machine learning are changing the landscape in the European region. What do we see as the level of acceptance for these technologies in the market? I know this is something we've touched on a little bit in this first section, but uh, perhaps yourself or Hans Hendrik could uh, give a little bit more input about the the level of acceptance. Well, I can I can give the uh, the numbers, but like I said, it's 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 all, almost immediately outdated uh, because the developments are going so fast. Um, acceptance in a way of people using it personally, I, I think that's, I mean, the 83% the is, is crazy, but on the other hand, um, I mean, if I look around my friends and family, well, friends and colleagues, I must say, because like people who are retired are usually not that keen, but then the 83% would make sense. Um, but Hans, can you do you have any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, there's um, there's no doubt that 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 the adoption is high um, and and the willingness to do that is high. And it strikes me one of the things that strikes me working with the with some of the countries that I've been working with is that time has a difference in different importance uh, for Europeans compared to many of the countries that I've worked with. Time is just so essential in Europe because time is expensive. And that's a very, very, very big difference from uh, if, if you're working in, in the many of the countries, which is also represented here, then time has a less cost. And therefore, the, the rationals for, for implementing technology that save time is just really there uh, when it comes to Europe, even though it's uh, it's just a few minutes or half an hour or whatever it is, uh, that's essential. And then there's a pressure from market all over the place for having speedy answers and fast uh, responses to all their inquiries and so forth. And those two things in combination just creates a different need from the European market than, than at least I see in other parts of the world. Um, and, and, and that also, uh, feeds the, uh, the the need to adoption and, and the, uh, uh, the positivity, especially with companies and, and thereby also uh, with, uh, with, with people. Yeah. Absolutely. No, thank you. And indeed, I think uh, any any technology that will save time and make processes more efficient will will gain acceptance regardless of, uh, of how new it is. Um, a reminder to the audience, make use of our question uh, chat box, uh, keep the questions coming as we move into the following sections. So thanks uh, Hans-Henrik and Marik. Well, I think this is a, a very good time to talk about uh, specialization because uh, AI and uh, machine learning provides companies uh, with great opportunities to specialize. So in this section, uh, I will try to tell you a few things about specialists and generalists. Why is it good to be a specialist? What advantages uh, does it give you? And how to become a specialist, uh, a kind of step-by-step uh, -step approach to becoming a uh, specialist. Uh, but first thing first, because many companies I talk with, they think and they say, they declare that they are a specialist because they master 
a number of technologies. Now, one thing that um, many of the companies learned the hard way, the technology itself uh, doesn't make a, a company a specialist, at least not in uh, most cases. There are exceptions, uh, but in most cases, a technology or a set of technologies that uh, a company masters doesn't make the company a uh, specialist. So the question is, what does and how does a specialist look like? But before we get there, uh, we are going to make a very short poll about technologies that you are using. Great, so the answers are coming in. The question is, which programming languages do you currently speak? Reminder, you are able to select more than one, as I imagine is uh, the case with many of you. Already half of you have voted, so let's give it 10 more seconds to get it a little bit higher than half. And we'll be closing the poll. In three, two, one, let's see the results. All right, so, well, it's it's very good. Uh, Java, JavaScript, Python are very important. You will see in the, in the coming slides. Uh, what is interesting that Julia is uh, 5%, but you will see the relevance of that. Uh, and also, I find it, quite low percentage uh, that 38 uh, percent of the the voters use c++ uh, uh, for development but later we are going to see uh, what technologies are uh, the most relevant to ai and uh, machine learning but before that uh, here is a uh, a uh, a uh, moving uh, very short moving uh, So you can see that uh, that your your selection of the poll pretty much coincides with this uh, with this chart. Uh, but uh, this is a kind of a general description of the popularity of different uh, programming languages. Uh, if we look at uh, the technology portfolio side of uh, of uh, machine learning and AI. Uh, we we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, different uh, frameworks, uh, and uh, the languages are the most popular languages are Java, Python, C R, Julia, and Scala. So those are the those are the those are the languages that have been used mostly uh, in uh, AI projects. But uh, let's let's try to define who is a specialist and who is a generalist now uh, a robust technology portfolio is given but the specialists have beside technology portfolio they also have uh, a various uh, a very serious domain expertise uh, and or horizontal or vertical market specialization niche market focus and um, innovation or using some kind of disruptive technology or developing disruptive technology. So those are the specialists. Uh, and it doesn't mean that the company developed a solution 
for a certain uh, type of company makes it a, a, a specialist. But a specialist is, uh, is the one, the company that is, um, that is having this domain expertise or niche market focus as their main business uh, business in their operation. So that those are the, the specialists. So the next question is, uh, why is it good to be a specialist? Uh, there are a number of very clear advantages. Uh, it will give you very clear focus. It will make market segmentation and the definition of ideal customer uh, fairly easy. Uh, in that market segment that you are focusing on, a niche market for instance, you will have less competition, you will have much, much easier marketing, uh, you can get higher prices, but also there will be less price pressure. Now, if you are in the generalist corner, you will see that uh, there will be always somebody who can do it cheaper. So you are getting into a uh, price competition and honestly, you don't want to be there. Uh, if you are a specialist uh, and you are working for a number of companies in Europe, those companies are going to be your loyal clients because most probably it's quite difficult for them to replace you. Uh, you will generate more added value, therefore your prices might be higher. And also very important that uh, when you negotiate with suppliers, you will have more leverage in terms of uh, negotiating the contracting terms. So all in all, um, it is very good to be a specialist or at least market yourself as a, as a specialist. Of course, you need the, the necessary credentials, uh, the experiences and references. There are a number of risks also um, associated with, uh, with being a specialist. Uh, putting your, your, all your eggs in one basket. So you might have just one or very few customers. And if that customer, for whatever reason, decides not to work with you, then you will get a problem. Uh, a specialist might be vulnerable to market changes. And also there is a time limit while these opportunities uh, exist. And I think that's what we see now in uh, AI and uh, machine learning. So it's, it's at the very high hype uh, time. Uh, everybody talks about it. Um, it's a non-commodity niche market uh, segment, or at least you can find niche market segments. Uh, there are plenty of uh, opportunities for innovation and specialization. And there are many, many uh, market segments uh, that you can uh, that you can uh, you can uh, focus on. So, how to become a specialist? So, there are a number of uh, number of ways of uh, of uh, of doing it. But the most important, uh, uh, I can do it. But the most important thing is that that you should you should start a small research and development team uh, in order to find your niche. So my experience is that uh, many companies, uh, even small ones, I'm working with uh, small and medium sized uh, IT companies, uh, they don't have uh, research and development uh, activities. So the first thing is, I think that somehow you should set up a small team that is testing technologies, um, keeping an eye on what is happening on the local market, innovation hubs, universities, uh, professional associations that are in your country. So I think that's, the, that's the, the, one of the, the first and most important steps. Uh, I am sure that, that many companies um, who are attending this uh, webinar now face the, the, the situation that you have a local offer but you also want to bring out a, a European offer that meets the exact demand in Europe. Now, unfortunately, the local offer and the European demand not always meet. And therefore, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to bring out a valid uh, uh, offer for uh, Europe. Also, 
um, often companies on the local market uh, they develop uh, products whereas in Europe uh, those products are seldomly more marketable therefore uh, most probably those companies that want to enter the European market they want to offer um, software development or software related type of services so it's a it's a major mind shift from product focus to services focus and then if you have a small scale research and development team then the rest of the the rest of the process will come but i think the most important thing is that you have a research and development team maybe just a few people maybe just a few people uh, part time uh, that are focusing on uh, up and coming technologies and um, and how those technologies are applied uh, in uh, niche markets. Uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about specialization. So just uh, to summarize it, it's very important. It's a very good position if you are if you are there, um, and you have far more and easier market chances in Europe if you can uh, if you can prove that you are a specialist and not a generalist uh, and maybe you have a few questions right now there are actually uh, some uh, interesting uh, questions in the chat one that um, is, uh, is it's probably for you, Laszlo, because uh, you are such a, a Julia fan. Um, mm. <laughs> there is someone who asks, I'm impressed that Julia is popping up. I have been preaching it for a year. Can you elaborate mm. more on the demand of Julia in of Julia development in Europe? Well, at the moment, I can't really, uh, I can't really uh, support that with numbers. But uh, since we didn't, uh, we didn't do research on that. On the other hand, uh, when we look at, uh, when we look at the, uh, let's say, the reports on the most important and most commonly used uh, development platforms uh, for AI, Julia just comes up almost everywhere. So. All in all, I guess Julia and uh, and Hans Henrik said that uh, at the end, the the final user doesn't really care about uh, the technology behind the application. So therefore, uh, if Julia is used uh, to develop AI applications and it's good for it, go for it. Yeah, yeah, well done and well said. And thank you for the question. And there's another one um that i i found very, very interesting as a as a market researcher um, um have we seen any specific changes in the knowledge process outsourcing industry as a direct impact of ai ml capabilities and how does that change the expectations from the talent pool for this industry in terms of skill sets well that's something to write a whole uh, product fact sheet about. Uh, I'm looking at Simona. We are writing another one this year. This could be the topic. <laughs> I would love to research this one. Um, um, I do would like to know from the person asking the question, um, what, what, what part of AI ML uh, capabilities are you talking about? Is it just the generative uh, AI or you also mean um, like uh, big data for, uh, for research and for outcomes in research and stuff? Maybe you can um, elaborate on that a little bit more in the, in the chat. And then we will get back to that question unless Laszlo feels like he has something interesting to share about this. Not, Not at pretty. this moment, I guess. So we did get a little bit of clarification that the question is specifically pointing towards procedures of data entry, initial research and really data analysis as well. Does that give a little bit more uh, information to answer? Yeah. Yeah, and then and then uh, the the person asking the question wants to know how the um, how the people that 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 work for that uh, how their skill set uh, might have to change because of those technologies. Oh my, 
Um, is it okay if I think about this for a bit while Laszlo continues? Because then I can give a more, like a good answer instead of just blabbing. Yeah, sure. is that okay? stage and um, there's also I mean since we're already touching on different types of industries there's also a question about opportunities of using artificial intelligence and machine learning in OPEX and supply chain so perhaps we can bundle those questions and get back to them towards the end yeah thank you I will I'm on them Uh, maybe just one addition to knowledge process outsourcing, uh, to the knowledge process outsourcing question and the changes in the in the required skills and all that. Well, uh, I think um, AI is going to help research, all kinds of research, uh, legal research, medical research, uh, very much. But I think uh, when a company is going to use uh, as a business uh, AI technology, uh, data verification is going to be very, very important. So I think uh, those companies that are using uh, AI for their, uh, for their knowledge process outsourcing business, uh, all kinds of verification of data and answers and statistics uh, will be very important because uh, as we know now, and, and the reports uh, suggest that, that uh, if, if we are using uh, uh, AI systems, it's quite difficult to confuse them. And at the end of the day, uh, all just gibberish answers uh, come out of them, even though those answers look very professional, but completely untrue. So I think uh, verification is going to be very important on the long run uh, when somebody is using um, AI systems for their business. Thank you. Then I can maybe get back to the, the knowledge process outsourcing question briefly. I'm just to yeah elaborate on on your answer is is uh, um, that for sure uh, checking data is is super important and remains very important and the ability to ask the right questions. Um, because you you need to know what you need to know, uh, and even if you have very intelligent uh, systems, if you don't ask the right question, then uh, you won't get a good answer. Uh, at least you know, because I'm I am also um, in this business uh, globally. Cool. We also uh, we're also a research uh, company, and um, and for anyone who's ever worked with generative AI, for example, they will know that. Um, you can ask just a question on top of your head and you can get a very elaborate answer that doesn't make any sense because it was actually not what you were looking for. So it makes you uh, really think about what is it exactly that I need to know, who am I writing for, um, and only then um, the system can uh, help you get that answer. So. Uh, yeah, there is something more about that. Um, and for supply chain, what it can mean for supply chain, a lot, I think. Uh, generative AI uh, has a lot of, I mean, um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning has many opportunities in the supply chain uh, industry because it's just, yeah, it can help you with the, uh, with stocks and with uh, what you need to buy, expiration dates. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely big opportunities there as well for the industry, people in supply chain. Just yeah. a small uh, comment uh, to supply chain, uh, more a little bit of an anecdote. Um, a thing like humidity in the air actually has a, an impact to fuel consumption. Um, Having a factor like that uh, in the planning of routes and, and so forth is just one out of quite a, a lot of examples on, on where you can suddenly start working with, with more uh, data sources, more data in order to, um, to actually optimize your logistics and, and, and so forth. But that also
also demands more uh, uh, processing power in, in, in the hardware and so forth. And then, then we're getting into the quantum uh, uh, area again. Yeah. So just a small, uh, I, I found it uh, quite uh, funny when I heard about uh, a thing like that, that small uh, things like that is actually, and it's also my, uh, quite a good example on where we are in Europe when it comes to to uh, optimizing things that we would like to take a factor like that into consideration, uh, planning, uh, logistic routes and so forth. Yeah. And if you talk about time, for example, my my uh, and how important time is uh, for for Europeans. Um, my husband works for a big pharmaceutical company, which is quite close to our house, and they have, for example, uh, medical uh, um, like uh, like like bags with 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 like uh, fillings for syringes and stuff. That can, uh, if they get too warm, then they have to throw them out, and it's like millions that you know are at stake so if the weather gets really hot he sometimes ha has to bike over there to check if, if 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 it doesn't get too hot so i mean there are a lot of uh opportunities for uh ai to to make these supply chain uh, processes a lot easier i mean i think we can conclude that the opportunities are almost pretty much endless it's just yeah how much information do you want to uh disclose and how much money do you want to pour into to it to to get that solution and perhaps moving then into a more a more practical question uh, that we have here from rohan uh what ai apis are available for integration with our own applications do we have any feedback on that Yeah, maybe. Um, I I think uh, most of the the large uh, large vendors, uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, they all provide uh, already uh, uh, APIs uh, for for uh, for uh, AI programming. Uh, also, OpenAI is uh, is uh, is having a, a application programming interface uh, for. Uh, for integrating uh, integrating uh, uh, AI into uh, different applications, so I think uh, most of the companies that are uh, that are developing, uh, let's say, baseline uh, AI uh, systems, will make access uh, to it through APIs. That's I mean that's that's the way, and that's how they uh, at the end they make money. You just have to uh, you just have to pay attention who is there, who is making it, uh, what is available, and what kind of uh, what kind of API do they provide. But or but uh, they are already uh, they are already there. So Great. yeah. Shall we move on to the next section of our program? All right. Uh, so uh, the next uh, the next uh, question, and I, I, I always I think everybody who uh, who is in uh, in the IT outsourcing business uh, on the consulting side and on the on the coaching side, uh, we always ask the question: How and where do we find buyers? How do we do that? Now um, I try to give you a few hints on um, on how to do that uh, and what steps you can take in order to successfully uh, find your buyers. Now, the first thing is that if you think about it, you are not looking for buyers, but you are looking for contacts. So that is the first thing that you have to realize that when you are looking for buyers, you are looking for contacts. There is a name of this chart, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, very uh, extensively. Um, but it's a funnel. So it means that the more contacts you make, the more high quality contacts you make, the higher the chance that at the end, when you drive through these contacts, that funnel, that process that you might have, at the end, you will have a buyer. So whatever what what you can take away from this chart is that you have 
ideally you have a lot of promotion activities but all these activities should focus on generating very high quality contacts that's the first step in uh, in terms of at the end of the process uh, finding buyers uh, but when we think about that uh, it also uh, generates uh, some questions for instance how large is your uh, is your uh, european professional network of contacts so i don't know i don't know in your case uh, but the bigger that is, the higher the chance that you will have uh, clients. What is the quality of uh, those uh, European contacts? Now, how do we define those qualities? That's another, uh, that's another uh, question and maybe another, uh, another session on um, a webinar. Uh, the next question is if you have a plan, a process and preset objectives to grow your European network. How do you do that? And do you have a team or at least a person in your company, uh, and this is very important, who is regularly and systematically finds and manages European contacts? Now, to answer these questions, my experience is that uh, many of the uh, small and medium-sized uh, IT service providers in emerging nations uh, they don't have a satisfactory factory, uh, answer to these questions. Uh, very often they don't have a single person that is taking care of the European contacts. European contacts are not generated on a regular basis in a systematic way. Uh, but these activities are very much point in time activities when and if somebody offers some kind of activities uh, a local trade promotion office offers a trade mission to europe okay then we are going to make contacts somebody is uh, pointing you to an event in europe where there you are going to make uh, contacts so very often these activities are very much uh, point in, uh, in in time activities so uh, my advice that if you want to find buyers what you need to really find is very high quality contacts and you have to build a large, the lar as large as possible uh, professional European uh, network. Now, consultants, matchmakers, Locke and your, uh, I don't know, your, your uncle who is living in Germany uh, that might bring you a few clients, but my experience is that uh, based on that, you are not going to be able to set up a sustainable European business line within your company. You might have a few references, but uh, nothing more and nothing, uh, nothing less. Uh, so the next question is, who are your buyers? Now, this is a chart uh, that we have been using. We call it the trade channel, uh, trade channels of IT outsourcing. Uh, the important part is that uh, if you look at this chart, only two players are going to pay you for your work. Those are the strategic partners and the final user of services that might come from any kind of industry. Just think about a restaurant, a hospital, a school, um, a machine factory or any kind of business that needs some kind of uh, solution that you might be able to provide. Uh, the rest, the matchmakers, the sales representatives, your local office, if you have, or the online platforms, they just provide you help to find either uh, a final user or a strategic partner. But later I would like to talk a little bit uh, more about this uh, two uh, uh, entities, the strategic partners and the final users of, uh, of your, your services. Now, the first thing, uh, many companies are focusing on finding strategic partners. Why is that? Because there are some difficulties uh, of finding uh, final users of your service or products uh, in Europe. Uh, and one of the one of the main reason is that companies in Europe uh, already long time ago 
most probably outsource their uh, IT operations. That means software, uh, hardware, networks, security, whatever you can imagine, they have been outsourced, not offshore and near shore, most probably, but locally. So a local IT company is doing all those things for those, um, for those companies that are coming from all kinds of industries. Therefore, they don't have uh, in-house uh, expertise. They don't have uh, IT project management uh, knowledge. They don't have uh, experience in that one. Uh, most probably, uh, especially the smaller companies, they have no experience with working together uh, companies offshore or near shore. Sometimes uh, these companies are not allowed to work with uh, companies that are not in the EU or not local companies. Just think about the local and EU tenders and consortiums that are formed. Uh, very often, a local company uh, again, any kind of company, not a, an IT company, they require, if they buy a type of IT service or products, they definitely would require local presence for support, training, consulting, and all kinds of activities that are very difficult to arrange online. And very often there are also language barriers. So. You look at different uh, countries in Europe and then you will realize that the average uh, company, again, any kind of company, uh, they might not be able to speak the necessary level of English or they can, but they won't. So when you try to work directly uh, with companies, uh, you might also encounter some uh, language barriers. Uh, so if you look at this list, then you can, uh, you can understand why most of the IT service providers uh, do not necessarily want to work directly with the end user of uh, their services or product, but rather they are looking for strategic partners. Now, who are those? Those are technology companies in the selected markets in Europe, IT companies that are developing products, uh, they are uh, developing software, uh, they are providing all kinds of IT services to local companies. Uh, ideally, the size of that company that you target should be somehow comparable to your company size. Again, the technology and the market focus um, should somehow match. But I would like to highlight the, 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 the size. I had seen a lot of uh, smaller sized companies coming from emerging markets uh, targeting really large companies. And I can tell you that uh, only a very, very few projects have materialized. On the other hand, those companies, those small companies spent an awful lot of time trying to get into this, uh, this, uh, this um, service provider list of these large technology companies or, or, uh, or system integrators or consultancies uh, or, project or, or IT project management companies. So uh, my experience is that if your company is a relatively small sized IT service providers, uh, you should try to target similar sized companies. Uh, these local companies, these local technology companies, they have their own client base. Uh, on the other hand, from both sides, usually a, a working together requires a long-term commitment. Uh, and most importantly, trust must be earned. Um, so they are not going to, the European companies are not going to just accept that you are there and you are good. You will have to show something and references will help you with that. Uh, naturally, you need a, a set of other uh, type of uh, skills, language, technical skills uh, must be there, soft skills, project management skills, uh, a certain type of software development methodology is, uh, is usually required. Uh, eventually certification, communication skills, and so forth, and so forth. 
um, it's a it's a long story and uh, and and but it has to be looked at all these requirements uh, individually when and how uh, the companies are uh, kind of evaluating each other now finding a strategic partner and working uh, with those uh, also have some risks uh, potentially you will be cut out of certain markets so contractually you will you you won't be able to market yourself uh, in certain geographies for instance so you will you might have uh, limited uh, marketing opportunities further your partner your strategic partner is not going to promote your company you will be the offshore development center they are not going to tell how and what and uh, and which company so basically you will be invisible to those companies that your partner is working with uh, when it comes to contract negotiations ip rights are always a question uh, and the bottom line is that uh, since you won't have too much negotiating power uh, most of the ip rights uh, will remain with your uh, european partner you also have to be prepared for one more thing which is quite important that many European companies would prefer a near shore option, even if they are open for uh, for for outsourcing. Um, very often they they just prefer a near shore uh, option. Uh, now, having said that, how to find those uh, professional partners? First of all, you need to prepare yourself. And I will tell you a few uh, very important points uh, here. One thing is that you should be able to tell very clearly uh, in a very short story what you are exactly selling, what you are really good at. And my experience is that, uh, that many companies are not really capable of doing that uh, in, a, in, a, in a very, uh, very short, uh, short way. So I think that's the... That's a, that is a very important part of the preparation. The second thing is that you should, uh, you should choose your target, your ideal customers uh, very well. And as I said, if you are a specialist, that is a much easier uh, task than uh, if, you are, if you are a generalist. Now you can combine online and offline activities. I'm not going to, uh, to, to, to to give you too many details about that because we have training programs about that but i would like to highlight two things your website and direct marketing because many times it pops up first of all your website has to be professional now if you are not a web developer and you don't have a graphic designers in-house then i think the best thing to do is to uh, to 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 hire uh, the right uh, company who can do that. The second thing is that most probably you have a local offer, so separate your local offer from your outsourcing offer. That is uh, that is a very important uh, thing. Uh, now, the third question is very important. Are you going to use your, uh, your website as an extended brochure, or you are going to use your website actively attract contacts? Uh, my experience is that uh, most companies are using their uh, website as an extended brochure where search engine optimization becomes uh, very important, uh, whereas search engine marketing, uh, pay-per-click uh, campaigns and content marketing might not be that important and might not be that viable. Uh, we have uh, quite some experience with that uh, and at the end of the day uh, very small or medium-sized uh, IT companies got a problem with generating meaningful content on a regular basis that would be necessary for content marketing again this is a long story and uh, and there are uh, there are again uh, we also have training programs about that now about direct marketing you have to be very uh, very careful with that uh, you don't want to be uh, a spammer uh, european companies don't take it too lightly 
when you just uh, you just inundate them with uh, with uh, with unnecessary uh, emails uh, or calls. Now, direct marketing is the least effective uh, way of marketing. But if you do it, you do it professionally, uh, and most probably you don't have uh, the the necessary skills and the necessary uh, experience to do it yourself. So most probably you will have to farm it out to a specialized agency that is available. There are those agencies that can do it for you, but if you try to do it yourself, uh, most probably it's not going to be too, um, too successful. So even if you think about that, just, uh, just be careful and uh, use specialized agencies and services if you don't have those uh, in-house expertise. Now I would like to, uh, I would like to give you an example of how to find and what to do with uh, companies that you might just find on the web. So let's uh, suppose that our target is the Netherlands and we are looking for companies uh, with artificial intelligence related activities. So first of all, what is the Dutch word for job, job vacancies, vacatures? Um, now, the next step is to finding recruitment platforms, job sites. There are many names uh, they have been using. Basically, those sites uh, where the available jobs uh, are listed. And on those sites, search for artificial intelligence. Now, I selected a random Dutch uh, job site and uh, I searched for artificial intelligence and it gave me 994 uh, job offers so what do we know now uh, and what do we know now we know that there are uh, there are quite a number of companies that are looking for uh, looking for people with artificial intelligence uh, experience uh, that is one thing we know the second thing we know that since this is a Dutch uh, job site, we know that these companies are looking for local people. We also know that most probably uh, many of them won't find uh, these people unless they are going to get it from another company. Because as uh, Marika said, that there is a there is a major uh, major uh, uh, labor shortage in in IT. So most most probably these companies will have some kind of problem of finding uh, those uh, those people with all kinds of artificial intelligence uh, experience. So that's what we know. We also know that European companies uh, do not really like a direct uh, sales offer. Basically, they are either they don't like it and they are not willing to talk to you. Uh, uh, so, if you try to contact them directly, that is not going to lead you too far away. So, what can you do? Uh, maybe I will give you three hints that you can do, but otherwise, uh, I think the, the limit is your imagination. So, the first thing is that you might want to, uh, you might want to organize a, um, a uh, matchmaking event but please don't call it a matchmaking event where you can invite all those companies that are placing these uh, these offers uh, and i can tell you that if you just hire a, an empty room with a with a with a few table and you put there some people um, that will talk about your company very few uh, dutch companies will show up so you have to offer some kind of uh, entertainment let's put it this way you can organize it on a boat on a restaurant a bike tour related to that and then you can uh, you can talk about uh, you can talk about um, uh, artificial intelligence further in holland there are quite a number of companies that are specialized uh, on organizing these type of uh, matchmaking events so you might consider organizing these kind of uh, these kind of events the second thing that you can do, uh, you can contact these companies, but not with your sales offer, but basically you can do market research. And I can tell you that our experience is that if you, if you target the company uh, with market research questions, 
they might not be that open, but they are much more open to that than a direct sales offer. And the third thing that you might uh, want to do is that if there is a relevant event, you might just invite those companies there. Again, that you have to offer something uh, where they feel that there is something in it for them to go there. Again, these are just some examples that we have we have tried, and these are examples that worked. Uh, again, you can ask, you can you can say that well, these are these are quite expensive. Yes, some of them are quite expensive, but you might want to uh, link up with other companies. You might find uh, uh, financing possibilities uh, from your local. Uh, association trade office etc etc again uh, you have 994 uh, job offers i don't know how how many from how many companies but most probably from a couple of hundred and the thing is that uh, it's up to your imagination to find a soft way of approaching these companies because that is uh, the one that is uh, that is working the best uh, I think not only in Holland, but in most uh, most countries in Europe. Uh, so that's what I wanted to tell you about it. And it's question time. Great. Thank you, Laszlo. And thanks for finishing it up with these very practical tips. Um, I don't see many questions coming in from the audience, but I was thinking, uh, now that we were on the subject of finding buyers, if there was anything perhaps that uh, Hans Henrik or Marika would like to add with some final tips to leave our audience with. Sure, uh, I'll be happy to do that. I think um, I, I agree very much about uh, what was just said. So these are just some uh, few add-ons to that. I think it's important to look at an entrance into Europe as a uh, strategical decision and an investment. And bear in mind the two words, because it's not just sales. Uh, basically, you will have to invest before you even get any revenue out of it uh, or any profit out of it. Uh, that is something that everybody should be uh, ready to accept. And then you also approach things in, in a kind of a different way also. Um, then there's uh, registration, the registration part, which I also think is, is quite important. Um, that differs uh, from from uh, many other places and one of the major differences is of course the uh, gdpr in, uh, in europe and the um, restrictions of moving data in in and out of europe there are ways to get uh, not around it but but abide by the the law on that but you have to study that you have to not only uh, write it in a contract um, you also have to live by it and uh, because you will be monitored on it, you will be sanctioned on it if you do not abide by it. So uh, we have to respect the, um, the, um, the, the legislation of uh, the EU, especially on, on data and, and, and so forth. There are ways to, to handle it, but uh, in order to handle it, you, you need to understand the legislation, so you have to invest in that. Um, and then, as an old uh, army guy, um, uh, focus is the essence of all attacks, um, and uh, and therefore Europe is a, is a, a unit uh, unit you could say. But it would be the same as saying, well, okay, I'll address the Asian market or something like that. Um, you need to focus basically down to country or or even city or. Uh, a specific business area or, or something like that and then use your efforts on that um, and that of course takes a little bit of uh, research to, to to find the right spot uh, and, and so forth and I agree quite a lot on on, on uh, the other side uh, that, that was just presented um, and then um, make an effort into uh, to understand the culture um, understand the different cultures and Europe is definitely not one culture it's a multiple co co uh, cultures there's differences between uh, uh, within side countries and, and so forth and even for me as a Dane uh, 
it's not straightforward just to go to Sweden or to Germany to, to sell anything, uh, even though I would be able to speak the language and everything, um, because it is a different culture. So uh, that is something to definitely read up on and, um, and really uh, dig into so that you understand that that will that will increase the uh, success rate uh, quite drastically also, I, I believe. Yeah, so that was just a few comments um, on that, I think. Um, I really agree about uh, using whatever contacts you have in order to kind of get through um, in the first place, because uh, some sort of a local presence is, is really, really important. Um, and uh, getting a salesperson is just normally too, too expensive uh, in the beginning. Um, I would imagine most European countries, if you need uh, to, to get a salesperson in, in place in the country with a, with a decent uh, 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 quality, it's at least 100,000 uh, euros that, that, that you need to put into that investment uh, for a year. So uh, it's, it's, it's a large, a fairly large sum that, that has to be invested. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thanks for those uh, final final pointers. Um, in fact, I think it's a nice way to move on to the last part of today's webinar, because, of course, you all just heard from Hans Henrik about the importance of being familiar with European legislation, about getting to know the culture and what kind of buyers um, you'll be in touch with. So um, I mentioned at the start that one of CBI's missions is to provide additional information for SMEs looking to access the European market. Now you've heard some information in this webinar, of course, uh, we've just provided uh, an hour and a half of tips and background information, but we have a lot more. And this information is available at CBI's website for free um, and takes the form of multiple studies. Now today we focused on AI and uh, ML, but in general, we have an entire sector dedicated to outsourcing, whether it's IT outsourcing or business process outsourcing, that covers a variety of uh, sectors and industries and services that in some cases uh, may be quite relevant to you as well. So with that being said, the final tip is to use the resources we have, use CBI's market studies to prepare yourself. As I mentioned, you can access them on our website. If you enter through cbi.eu, you'll see market information as one of the tabs at the top. And as I was saying, we have a specific section dedicated to outsourcing services. We generally have four types of studies. Uh, these have been um, circled here. So you have sector studies where we provide more information about what the market looks like, what trends are currently offering opportunities. We include services studies that dive a little bit further into a particular service within the industry. So you see there are some examples are the retail tech service, mobile applications, cybersecurity, and there's even more that aren't included in this list. Once you've gathered more information about the kind of market and the services that uh, you'd like to access within Europe, you can go into our tip studies. So these provide a number of five to ten practical tips about, for example, how to do business, um, about how to organize your exports. We also recently published one about tips to make your business greener and more environmentally friendly. Now, this is something that I can tell you European importers uh, really value. So when you make that first approach that uh, Laszlo was mentioning, um, it would really be appreciated if you include some information about how environmentally responsible your company is. I mean, that's a nice, uh, unique selling proposition and can give you a bit of a competitive edge. And finally, we also have a couple of studies that are focused on specific countries, in this case, Senegal and Uganda. I would also like to say that because of today's webinar, we actually just published a new study, a service study that really dives into the market and the procedures for entering this market. And it's focused on exporting artificial intelligence and machine learning software development services. So it's really specifically about the development services to Europe. So I would encourage you all to go to our website this afternoon or after this webinar and have a look at this uh, new study that was published just today, uh, June 21st. 
With that being said, um, I'd like to just uh, call my fellow presenters and panelists to turn on their camera and just to thank them for being here today, for providing all this information. Um, so you can always uh, stay in touch with CBI and perhaps uh, get in touch with these experts as well and ask questions by firstly signing up to our newsletter. You can do that through our website or sending us a direct question, um, which you can see through a contact us button. And we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Any last words from our panelists? No, but just uh, a thank you for uh, everyone that was here today on screen and uh, on the other side. And uh, hopefully you will be reading our studies and that you'll be very successful in uh, your endeavors. Indeed. So with that, I'd like to close this webinar. Thank you all for attending. And um, as Samarika said, we hope you make use of the further resources we have available for you all. Have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye.